Oral questions, Question Oral, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. The Liberal government's argument for invoking the Emergencies Act on Canadians is very quickly falling apart. Mm -hmm. Last week we learned the RCMP did not ask the government to invoke the Act, and just yesterday we learned the Ottawa police didn't either. Oh. Le the Liberals are simply not telling Canadians the truth. The Emergency Measures Act was an overreach by the Prime Minister and a government in trouble. Their power grab was just another example of classic Liberal cover-up, deny and blame. Isn't that the truth, Mr. Speaker? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The illegal blockades in our cities and at our ports represented a threat to Canadian jobs, to trade and to our democracy. Police told us they needed additional tools to clear the blockades and as the OPP Chief Superintendent Carson Party said at yesterday's meeting, and I quote, the Emergencies Act gave police effective supplementary tools needed to help protect critical infrastructure, ensure the continuous and safe delivery of essential goods and services, while at the same time maintaining, or in the case of Ottawa, restoring peace, Excellent. order, and public security. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The Prime Minister's divisiveness is the reason the protest started, and his failure to lead is the reason yes. it got worse. The Prime Minister called people names. He wedged, he divided, and then he spread misinformation. Mm -hmm. Then to deal with the mess that he created, he invoked the Emergencies <laughs> Act, stomping on freedoms and freezing bank accounts. Now he's covering up. The time has come for the Prime Minister to stop spreading disinformation, stop hiding the fact that he and his ministers had no valid reason to invoke the Emergencies Act. Will he do that? Will he tell the truth? Here, here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, in February, when blockades and occupations disrupted our economy, hurt workers and endangered public safety, we invoked the Emergencies Act to help bring them to an end. We've now announced the Public Order Emergency Commission, an independent public inquiry, to examine the circumstances that led to the declaration being issued and the measures taken in response as required under the Act. I know that the leader of the Conservative Party, the interim leader of the Conservative Party, as well as members of the Conservative Party, may not want light shed on these events giving their support of these blockades, but Canadians want to know the truth. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. More disinformation from this Prime Minister exactly. should be ashamed of what he just said. Now, Mr. Speaker, airports across the country are at a breaking point with massive lineups and delays. People are waiting for months and months and months for passports and basic government services, and it's all because of this Prime Minister's failure. While the world has moved on from COVID, Canada is stuck in out-of-date restrictions and rules because the Liberal Prime Minister is stubborn, out of touch, and out of date. My question is simple. Exactly. When will Canada get back to pre-COVID normal? Yeah. When will Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as much as the Conservatives would like to ignore it, COVID-19 is still with us and will continue to be will with, with us, and Canadians need to continue to follow the best science in order to keep people safe. In regards to airports, our government has already taken action to reduce wait times by standing up working groups with relevant agencies to identify and address bottlenecks and hiring about 400 additional security screeners. The CBSA has also added 25 kiosks at Pearson Airport to speed up processing time and increased overtime available to officers. Unfortunately uh, for Conservatives, we will continue to follow the science and keep Canadians safe. Order. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, Canadians know the Prime Minister doesn't have to wait for hours in line at an airport when he wants to go somewhere. He just hops on his government jet and flies wherever he likes. Yep. Once there, off goes his mask and he enjoys the freedom that country is visiting. And I guess COVID isn't in those particular countries. Meanwhile, back in Canada, Canadians are suffering under his out-of-date COVID rules. Canadians have done everything that they've been asked to do. They have done everything expected of yes. them. When are they going to get back to the pre-COVID life they need and they deserve? Yeah. Yeah. The right Honourable Prime Minister.
Sure. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians are sick and tired of COVID. We all agree on that one. But wishing it away or ignoring it will simply not make it go away. Over the past months, we've seen more deaths from COVID than from at any time in the beginning of the pandemic. We will continue to do the work the Canadians elected us to do just six months ago and do everything necessary to keep Canadians safe. I know Conservatives have not been unequivocal on the need for vaccines. They've been hesitant. They've been supporting anti-vaxxers. We will continue to stand on the side of keeping Canadians safe. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. He goes again spreading more disinformation when he's got no ballot argument. It's disinformation on that side. Well, Speaker, the Prime Minister doesn't have to wait in a line. He doesn't have to worry about filling up his tank, buying groceries, or buying a home. Young people in this country are desperately worried about those things, and they know the Prime Minister either doesn't understand or he just doesn't care. They see a Prime Minister who blames everyone else for the problems he has created. The fact is, millions of young Canadians are seeing the truth. They don't trust the Prime Minister. They don't believe he understands their struggles. Why is he ignoring and disrespecting young Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. From the beginning of the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we made a promise to Canadians that we would have their backs, and that especially included young Canadians, uh, where we invested in support uh, for the kinds of small businesses that keep young people employed, that we uh, reduced uh, student costs, uh, tuition costs, support in terms of uh, student loans. We've continued to invest in increasing Canada's summer jobs to make sure they got through the pandemic. We've consistently been there for young people, and every step of the way, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives criticize us for doing as much as we have to help young people. They've criticized us for not supporting young people, uh, for supporting young people at all. We will continue to be there for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Like they say at Mass, let there be light. I fully understand now why the Prime Minister was so hostile to our motion on the separation of church and state. He had planned a week with the heir of the British throne, who will be the future religious chief of the Anglican Church. We understand his priorities. Now that we know that we have to pray for the crown, for the monarchy, for the British monarchy of all things, when they are welcomed here. Can the Prime Minister tell us how much this has all cost us? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I can only imagine that, oh my, the Liberal government in Ottawa must be delivering amazing things for Quebec, as if the only thing that the leader of the Quebecois can complain about is the monarchy and praying in the House of Commons. We are delivering more places for young children in Quebec. We are helping small companies. We are working for more immigration to counter the labour shortages. We are here to deliver for Quebecers and all Canadians. And so, I believe that the leader of the Bloc Québécois has to dig deep in order to find something to say. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Well, for the Prime Minister, $2.2 million vacations are very cheap. There's always an island ready to welcome him. But the truth of the matter is that many Quebecers and most Canadians do not want the British monarchy. Over $2 million this week, $65 million a year. Tourism usually should bring money into Canada not the opposite. So who will be footing the bill? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Let us be serious. Just one second, Mr Speaker. I'm pleased to say that here in Canada, we have one of the strongest and stable democracies in the world, and we see how democracy is under attack, literally, in Ukraine and f elsewhere in the world with the polarization, toxicity, and the reduction of democracy in many corners of this world. Canada can be proud that, yes, we do have a system that exists for, uh, that has existed for a long time, so that we can continue on the big issues that concern Canadians, and not just, one, uh, not just our own stability. And this is a good thing, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Here's the situation in Canada. 
In April, inflation hit 6.7%, the highest since 1991. The cost of food has gone up by 9.8%, and salaries have only gone up by 3.3%. All of this to say, workers are experiencing a massive pay cut, all the while oil and gas companies are enjoying massive profits. The Prime Minister can do something instead of just standing by. Will the Prime Minister follow our plan, cancel the fossil fuel subsidies, reinvest that into people by sending them up to $1,000 directly for those who need it the most? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies in the next two years and have already phased out eight tax breaks for the sector. We recently presented the Emissions Reductions Plan that goes line by line to cut emissions and will inform our approach to cap and cut emissions from oil and gas. We're taking real action to fight climate change by committing over $100 billion to climate action and by making sure that polluting is no longer free anywhere in the country. We're going to keep pushing forward, and I'm looking forward to the support uh, of the leader of the NDP in doing just that. Hello, that the Deputy. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Well, this is the situation throughout the country. The cost of food has gone up by 9.8%, but salaries have only increased by 3.3%. This means that for workers, huge cuts in their relative pay. So the Liberal government has an option. Act. They can follow our plan in order to eliminate oil and gas subsidies, reinvesting the money to help people by giving them up to $1,000 directly. Will the government finally follow our plan? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I know that Canadians from coast to coast to coast are facing terrible, a terrible situation because of increased costs, and we will continue to support them. Now, with regards to the public funding of uh, fossil fuel companies, we are progressively eliminating these subsidies, and nothing will divert our offer for Canadians. That is a strong economy and clean air. Export and Economic Development Canada keeps giving subsidies in order to then pivot towards green energy. Canada has announced its intention to stop all direct public funding for the international fossil fuel industry. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, violent crime is increasing under this Prime Minister. Gun crime is up 83 per cent since the Liberals took office. At the same time, they're going to make it allowable for criminals to get house arrest instead of go to jail for armed robbery, weapons trafficking, drug trafficking, breaking and entering possession of illegal firearms and drive-by shootings. He is going after law-abiding Canadians, but going soft on gangsters who don't care about his rules and paper will work. Will he scrap Bill C-5? Right Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our criminal justice reform legislation turns the page on failed Conservative Party policies. They claim to be tough on crime, but really just tough on black Canadians and Indigenous people. What our communities need is a justice system that punishes criminals. What we don't need is a system that targets rape. A point of order. I believe that there was a suspension of interpretation. The translation happens. It's good there. Okay, are we ready for the, the honorable, the right honorable prime minister? You can back up a little bit. Mr. Speaker, our criminal justice reform legislation turns the page on failed Conservative Party policies right. where they claim to be tough on crime, but we're really just tough on black Canadians and on indigenous Canadians. What we need is a system that doesn't target people because of systemic discrimination, but sends people to prison because, or sends people to prison because they struggle with addiction. This bill is another step forward to create a system that is fair, effective, and keeps Canadians safe. The right honour. 
The Honourable Member for Lakeland. That's shameful. So instead of vile insults, let's actually talk about reality. Here, it's here. record highs in Toronto alone for most shootings, most murders, and most people injured in 2018 or 2019. And many who harm innocent Canadians are multiple repeat offenders. But this Prime Minister, he wants to make it easier for them to stay home among their victims for crimes like sexual and physical assaults, human trafficking, kidnapping, criminal harassment, failure to give the necessities of life and arson. These are major crimes that cause lifelong trauma and loss. So when will he stop punishing law-abiding Canadians and actually crack down on criminals? Yeah. Yeah. Right on the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let us be absolutely clear and avoid any disinformation from the Conservatives. This legislation does not stop police from charging people with gun offences or prosecutors from pursuing convictions. What it does make is make sure that criminals face serious penalties while addressing the overrepresentation of black Canadians and Indigenous peoples in the criminal justice system. This is a responsible approach to keep communities safe. The Honourable Member for Charlevoix, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, Thomas, 16 years of age, was shot and killed after having been stopped by an individual in an alley in the north of Montreal. Thomas was a resident of the riding of the Liberal MP for Bourassa. A 17 year old boy shot several times in the abdomen in Laurier Saint Marie died of his wounds. And now the NDP Liberal Coalition, along with the Bloc Québécois, want to fast track Bill C5, which will only help street gangs continue their shootings. Why? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the Conservatives should stop it with the disinformation. This legislative measure will not stop police officers from accusing anyone or arresting anyone and won't stop prosecutors. What it will do is make sure that criminals will be severely punished whilst diminishing the overrepresentation of black and Indigenous Canadians in our carceral system. This is a responsible approach for us to make sure that our communities are safe con as compared to the failed attempts of the Conservatives of the past. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg Saint Charles, Mr. Speaker. A criminal is a criminal is a criminal, irrespective of their race or creed. 90% of victims in 2021 are from criminal communities. So, be we white, black, indigenous, that changes nothing. Shooting someone illegally should be repressed, should be condemned. So why not stop C5 and, and install minimum? Mr. Speaker, our bill, C5, puts an end to failed policies from the Conservatives that claimed that they were going to fight against a criminality, but that did, but that only targeted black people and indigenous people. What our communities need is a justice system that punishes criminals. What we do not need is a system that targets racialized people because of systemic discrimination. This bill is a step in the right direction towards a fair and effective system that will guarantee the security of all Canadians. Order. We might, we might not like the questions, we might not like the answers, but we all have a right, we all have a right to, to, to speak in this House of Commons. Are we ready for the next question? Very good. The Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. The, the Liberals' Bill C-5 goes soft on violent crimes that are ripped right from the headlines. Just yesterday, a news story read, Montreal man charged with firearm offences after investigation into drive-by shootings. Mr. Speaker, this was right in the Prime Minister's own neighbourhood, yet his Bill C-5 lets drive-by shooters off easy. Why is he putting his own neighbours' lives at risk with the soft-on-crime Bill C-5? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, targeting the supply of guns and the root causes of violence is essential to ending gun and gang violence. So we're taking action by investing $250 million in communities directly to stop violence before it starts. We're banning military-style assault weapons and we're establishing a task force with the U.S. to end smuggling. But we know there's more to do because every life lost to gun violence is one too many. So I stand with communities 
communities, experts and advocates to say, don't worry, Conservatives, we're committed to doing even more on gun control. The Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. Yet the Prime Minister is not standing with victims. Victims have spoke loud and clear. And as a matter of fact, a poll published this week found that most Canadians feel that gun violence is getting worse in their communities. But rather than stopping illegal firearms from coming across the border, the Liberals' Bill C-5 will help repeat offenders charged with multiple violent gun crimes escape accountability. We know this Prime Minister likes to govern by opinion polls, so will he finally do the right thing, reverse courts, and abandon his soft on crime Bill C-5? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, allow us to be very clear in the face of misinformation and disinformation from the Conservatives. This legislation does not stop police from charging people with gun offences or prosecutors from pursuing convictions. Uh, we are moving forward on stronger gun control, both by interdicting uh, the flow of guns, illegal guns across the border, and continuing to step up on more gun control, because all Canadians are united in wanting to see less gun crime, less gun violence, and that's exactly what we're delivering, uh, uh, in contrary to the Conservatives, who want less gun control. As I've said before in this House, I don't mind a little bit of heckling. The incessant yelling is a little bit over the top. London the, the Honourable Member for Bello Chambly, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, has managed to invent democracy, uh, has, has invoked democracy and monarchy in the same sentence, which is pretty crazy. The monarchy that I'm paying, uh, for which I'm paying their holidays, this is a monarchy that has appointed Governor Generals and Lieutenant Governors that don't speak a word of French, can the Prime Minister explain to the Prince of Wales that the, the Dominion of Canada is bilingual? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, this afternoon I will be having a talk with the Prince of Wales and leaders from the business sector, with Indigenous leaders, to talk about the importance about fighting climate change. We know that this is a global issue and we are doing real leadership work in the world to ensure that there is a better investment and sustainable transition towards eco-energy. We will continue to work within our democratic system, our institutional system that is very strong democratically and that is what we'll deliver for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. So the Prince of Wales really needs to meet Indigenous peoples and business leaders. Okay. But at the same time, monarch, mon monarchy representatives don't speak French. Bill C-101 is being flouted. The Charter of the French Language should apparently not be used for federal companies. Is the Prime Minister just simply fomenting against French at the end of the day? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, with the modernization of the Official Languages Act, we are currently not only strengthening the protection of the French language within, Fran uh, within Quebec and without, but we are doing what the Bloc Québécois cannot do, that is to protect French throughout Canada. We will continue to be here for Francophone minorities that are facing huge challenges, and it is this Liberal government and the Liberal Party of Canada, not the Black Québécois, they will always be here to support Francophones to invest in their future. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister tell me if he is beginning consultation on a tariff on urea? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll ensure that the appropriate minister follows up with this matter. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Well, I guess we now understand why the Liberals are refusing to answer questions on a fertilizer tariff because they have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> In fact, stakeholders in meeting with ministers have been told that the Liberals had no idea that Canadian farmers actually purchased fertilizer from Russia. Now we're the only country in the world that has a tariff on fertilizer, and our producers are the ones who are paying the price. But typical Liberals, let's impose punishing policy first and let's ignore the devastating results afterwards in that follow. So will the Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister exempt the 35% tariff on Russian fertilizer purchased before March 2nd? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine has required us to step up on sanctions to punish Vladimir Putin and those who've supported and enabled his, his war. Uh, we know that countries around the world are facing hardships because of limits on Russian exports, and we've committed to being there to support Canadians who are facing these difficulties, whether it's the Evraz employees, uh, whether it's farmers uh, on, the, uh, on the East Coast who depend more on Russian fertilizer than those on the West Coast. Uh, we are going to be there to continue uh, to support Canadian farmers through this difficult time. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr Speaker, the seeding season is upon us and our farmers are worried. Since last autumn, the price of fuel and fertiliser has more than doubled and continues to rise under the neoliberal government with an inflation rate of 6.8%. Moreover, does this government not realise that the 35% tariff it imposes upon our farmers does not even penalise Russia in the first place? It only serves to cripple our farm families and double the cost of production of our Canadian food. When will the Prime Minister finally stand up for our Canadian farmers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We strongly condemn the unjust and illegal war conducted by Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. We know that fertilizer is essential for Canadian agriculture and we will continue and we continue to work with industry. Our government now allows producers to have access to $1 million in the anticipated payment program, the first tranche of $100,000 of which is without interest. Our government continues to support Canadian producers and farmers by giving them access to various programs that are here to help them to hedge and counter loss of revenue. Lethbridge. Because of this government's reckless spending, Canadians are becoming poorer and poorer by the day. That's because inflation has now reached a record of 6.8%. Groceries are up by 10%. Gas is over $2.30 a litre in parts of Western Canada. And housing prices have doubled. Sadly, these realities don't seem to register with the Prime Minister because, well, someone else puts his bills. So would he please demonstrate just a little bit of humility today, try to put himself in the shoes of working class Canadians, and will he stop the out of control spending that is condemning the Canadian people to a life of poverty? The right Honourable Prime Minister. We know families across this country and Canadians are facing uh, increased prices at the pumps and at the grocery stores, and that's why we've continued to move forward in ways that have their backs. Unlike the Conservatives who voted against our measures uh, on supporting families, we move forward with uh, early learning and childcare program that, as I announced in Newfoundland and Labrador yesterday, will save average families about $5,000 in their bills this year. Uh, these these are issues that these are investments that will support families right across the country. Now that every single province and territory, including the conservative ones, have signed on to our early learning and child care framework, country, pay, families are going to save thousands of dollars this year across the country. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. People are waiting for hours and hours at the airports. People are waiting extremely long just to get their passport, and none of this is a surprise. As soon as travel restrictions eased, people are going to travel. So why didn't the Prime Minister hire enough staff, have enough human resources, so that Canadians did not have to wait under these massive delays to receive airport, to receive their passport and other services federally, as well as being able to go and visit their family? Why? <laughs> Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is very good news that Canadians are starting to travel again. This is something that is exciting for everyone, uh, but we understand that the slowdowns around passports are difficult and stressful. Canadians are, are giving an inc a significant increase in demands for passports, so we created new centres to increase production capacity, hired 500 new employees and set up a new online booking tool to direct applicants to the best option for submitting their passport applications. We will continue exploring all options to improve the current situation. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Rogers takeover of Shaw will mean massive layoffs to workers. It's going to be bad for Canadians because of rising costs. It's certainly good for billionaires, though, and the billionaire families involved. And now there's a risk of another billionaire company, the Quebecor, that might buy Freedom Mobile, which is also going to be bad for workers with layoffs, bad for Canadians with the rising cost of cellular services, but again, good for billionaires. 
So when will the Prime Minister say no to billionaires, no to this merger, and yes to Canadians who deserve affordable cellular and internet services? Here, here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our priority has always been greater affordability, competition and innovation in the Canadian telecom sector. These goals are front and centre as we analyse the implications of this proposed deal. This transaction has been independently reviewed by the Competition Bureau of Canada and the CRTC. Our government will ensure that consumers are protected and that the broader public interest is served as this proposed merger is evaluated. The Honourable Member for Whitby. Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt the Ukrainian people have exhibited strength beyond measure. And yet, unfortunately, next week will mark three months since the start of Putin's illegal war on Ukraine. And Ukraine's President Zelensky has repeatedly thanked Canada for the aid and support to help his people defend themselves against the Russian invaders. Yet there still is no end in sight in this senseless war. And Ukraine's forces' need for lethal and non-lethal equipment is not winding down anytime soon. So, can the Prime Minister update this House on the support Canada is providing so Ukrainians can better defend their homeland? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Whitby for his question and for his hard work. Millions of dollars worth of our aid has arrived in Ukraine and is making a critical difference on the ground. To support our European allies, the Royal Canadian Air Force's C-130s have now moved two million pounds of military and humanitarian aid destined for Ukraine across the European continent, and this work continues every single day. As Ukrainian heroes fight back against Putin, we'll continue to help them win this war. Slava Ukraini! The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. This Prime Minister has called everyone on this side of the House just now a racist. Right. This is shameful. Shameful. That's right. And it is no thing that should happen in this House. Shameful. It's no surprise that many Canadians continue to reject his federal mandates, Mr. Speaker. And we know this is a cabinet decision, and we know that that makes it this Prime Minister's personal decision to punish his political opponents. Not allowing families to reunite is deeply hurtful yep. and is tantamount to ostracism and political vindictiveness. What's next to go for those who won't conform? Those he's described as taking up space, yep. which rights will he trample on next? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this pandemic, we made a very straightforward promise to Canadians that we would have their backs and that we would follow the science to keep them safe. That is exactly what we've done. The Conservative Party has been all over the place, uh, shouting that we should needed to deliver vaccines faster and then ignoring the need for vaccines once they arrive. Uh, they continue to want to wish this pandemic away, but magical thinking doesn't save lives in Canada, doesn't restore small businesses, doesn't grow our economy and get people back to work. That's why we continue to follow science. We continue to keep Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister talks about science. Let's talk about what the truth is. Imagine that we're living in a country that singles out 15 per cent of its population for special treatment. That means you mock their personal decisions, you call them names, and you tell them they're taking up space. Further imagine, Mr. Speaker, if you will, that their freedom to move around this very large country is also taken away. Why are they being singled out, Mr. Speaker? Because they made a personal health decision. Should other world leaders call out this Prime Minister for the vindictive behaviour? You bet they should. This is petty, it's petulant, and this behaviour must stop. On which date will Canada return to normal? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that question from the Honourable Member might be a little more convincing if the member from Cumberland, Colchester, hadn't just said a few weeks ago in this House that the vaccine mandates had an important purpose of keeping Canadians safe. So he agreed uh, that we had to have them uh, in place while the pandemic was going on. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, as all Canadians know, this pandemic has not yet ended. Canadians are still dying in larger numbers than they did previously previously during the pandemic, and we need to continue to do what is necessary to keep them safe. And Mr. Speaker, that's exactly what this government will continue to do. 
Just need to remind folks, questions are 35 seconds or so. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Speaker, international arrivals at Canadian airports are so backed up that people are being kept on planes for hours after they land because there isn't enough space for the long lineups. His minister blames travellers, and the world has embraced restriction-free travel. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Airports Council, and now health experts are telling this government that their outdated COVID restrictions have to go. Who's actually telling the government to keep those restrictions? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past months, Canadians continue to die at a higher rate than during the first two years uh, of COVID-19. The pandemic is still with us, and we need to continue to do what is necessary based on science to keep people safe. In regards to airport delays, uh, we're, we're hiring about 400 additional security screeners. We've added 25 kiosks at Pearson Airport to speed up processing time, increased overtime available to officers. It's a good thing that Canadians are starting to travel travel again, and we will be there to support them. But we're also going to continue to keep Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. The answer is nobody except for the spin doctors in the Liberal Cabinet. Yeah. Instead of telling Canadians they are out of practice, he could bring back the workers that they fired, he could stop the 4,000 uh, tests for incoming travellers each day, he could do what most other countries have done and end the restrictions. Why is he doing nothing? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we continue to evaluate and reevaluate the measures we have to keep Canadians safe, and we will continue to do exactly that. Canada uh, put in place measures that kept us uh, on a better track through this pandemic than just about uh, than most of our peer countries, and we will continue to make sure we're keeping Canadians safe, not just for the sake of keeping Canadians alive and healthy, which is itself a noble goal, but also because that's the best way to restore our economy. Uh, and our functioning, which is exactly what we're seeing with what this government has done to support small businesses and families across the country. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, we need a registry of criminal organizations to deal with the gang war in Greater Montreal. A registry would make police work easier by making gang membership an, an offence in and of itself. The day before yesterday, the Minister of Public Safety was in agreement, but yesterday he shut the door. What does the Prime Minister say today? While the federal government dithers, Montreal is slipping back into the biker wars of the 90s when it comes to shootings. Today we want a clear answer. Will the Prime Minister create a registry of criminal organizations, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, to put an end to gang violence, we have to deal with the root causes of this violence. Since 2017, we've invested over $358 million to improve enforcement mechanisms, to increase uh, prevention, and to fund local strategies to prevent and fight violence. We've also created a fund for safer communities, $250 million, with a view to preventing at-risk youth from getting involved in criminal activity. We will always be there with solutions that work. The Honourable Member for Avignon Amitis Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, last Wednesday, a Hells Angel was gunned down in broad daylight in the Prime Minister's own riding. Surely he realizes there's a gang problem in Montreal. We need a registry of criminal gangs in order to make being a gang member a crime. It's simple. It's the same idea as the list of terrorist entities. Right now, joining a terrorist group is criminal, but belonging to the Hells Angels or a street gang is okay. And yet the gangs are the ones spraying bullets all over the place right now. Why would the feds let them roam free? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it would be all well and good to have simplistic solutions to complex problems, but the fact is that the street gang problem and the problem of gun violence requires us to work on various levels, at the root causes, uh, on the symptoms as well, on prevention and so on. And that's precisely what we're doing. With hundreds of millions of dollars invested in communities with uh, tough, more tools and consequences uh, for police uh, dealing with uh, gun crimes 
and we will work with our municipal and provincial partners in fighting crime. The Deputy Department. The Honourable Member for Paul neuf jacques Mr. Speaker, the negative impacts of the pandemic are enormous. The cost of living has gone up. Businesses, businesses are facing major supply problems and an unprecedented labour shortage. And there's another major problem, the spike in mental health problems. This Liberal government needs to act now. Budget 2022 falls short. Can the Prime Minister commit to presenting a plan quickly to protect our young people who've been hit so hard by this crisis. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. First of all, I'd like to thank the member, the Conservative member, for recognizing that the pandemic has caused an increase in the cost of living and supply chain problems. We will continue to be there to help families who are struggling, and at the same time, we will also be there to invest in mental health care and we will support young people's mental health. We've already made historic investments, and we will continue to work in partnership with the provinces while, of course, respecting their jurisdiction in order to deliver mental health services to young people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, four times in the past two weeks, I've asked questions about the Canada mental health transfer, an election commitment quite obviously broken by the Liberal government. The minister never even pretended to attempt an answer. Page 75 of the Liberal platform clearly promises immediate funding of $250 million and then another $625 million in this year's budget. There has to be an explanation as to why the Liberals broke this significant promise to vulnerable Canadians. Can the Prime Minister simply tell us what that explanation is? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the course of the last two years, we invested about $69 billion dollars more than the federal government usually does uh, into health care across the country. Much of it transfers to provinces, uh, much of it direct investments in things like vaccines uh, and mental health programs like uh, the National Wellness uh, uh, Hotline and website. There is much more to do and we will do that, but we will do that in full respect of the province's jurisdiction over health care uh, in defining how it is we can move forward in a way that works for all Canadians. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we respect uh, the divisions of powers laid out by the Constitution. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Then why make the promise? Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister recently stood here and actually said with a straight face, quote, we will not simply fall back on slogans and easy solutions. Instead, with this government, it's always only slogans and no solutions. More than 30 times this year, including a couple times today, the Prime Minister has responded to legitimate questions by shrugging them off and offering yet another mind-numbing reference to, quote, having Canadians' backs. On his signature promise of a Canada mental health transfer, he's turning his back on Canadians who really need help. Yep. Again, simply, why is he breaking his word on such an important commitment? Great question. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I have said time and time again, we will be there to step up on investing more in health care, including on mental health across the country. But that needs to be done right, Mr. Speaker. It needs to be done in partnership with the provinces and territories. We cannot simply expect that throwing money at a problem is going to solve it in terms of delivery for Canadians. That's why we intend to work closely with the provinces in partnership on delivering better mental health care, on delivering better supports for Canadians as we have throughout this pandemic with historic investments of over $69 billion in additional funding for health care. The Honourable Member for Dorval, Lachine LaSalle. Mr. Speaker, today the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change is participating in a roundtable to be joined by the Prime Minister to discuss ongoing funding for the fight against climate change. Can the Prime Minister inform this House of this important initiative that will help Canada meet its emissions targets while supporting a strong economy in the long run? Thank you very much. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would first like to thank the member for Dorval, Lachine LaSalle, for her question and for the work, she, her hard work she does in her writing. Mr. Speaker, Canada is continuing to seek private sector sources to invest in sustainable development 
It's clear that their expertise is needed to reach our climate change objectives and to make a real change in the fight against global warming. Canada will, in this way, be able to meet our targets and support long-term economic growth. Speaker, uh, two quick questions to the Prime Minister. First, the World Health Assembly will be meeting next week. Does Canada support Taiwan's participation at next week's meeting? And second, the International Civil Aviation Organization's upcoming triannual assembly will be taking place in September. Does Canada support Taiwan's inclusion at that upcoming triannual assembly? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, Canada's position on Taiwan is long-standing. We support its inclusion in multilateral forum, multilateral bodies to make sure uh, that their perspective is heard. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Speaker, May 22nd to May 28th, Representatives from 194 countries will meet in Geneva at the World Health Assembly to discuss the WHO Global Pandemic Treaty and to vote on amendments to the international health regulations. Why didn't this Prime Minister establish a public health inquiry into our COVID response before considering signing amendments to the international health regulations? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as an active member of the WHO, Canada has always been there uh, to push for better science, to push uh, for better impacts uh, in the way we collaborate around the world. Uh, Canada is a leading voice on ensuring not only that we make it through this pandemic, which is continuing to be ongoing, uh, but also that we prepare uh, for future pandemics, which unfortunately may well be the reality for decades and generations to come. Uh, we will continue to be active, strong participants in international fora around health, while always uh, respecting and protecting Canada's sovereignty and choices to make uh, the right decisions for its own citizens. Now, I see someone standing, but uh, Wellington Halton Hills took the first question and the second one. So the next one in the sequence is Calgary Skyview. Well, it was two. Well, we're checking with the table and in the, sequ in the sequence, there was only two in the sake. I'm. Sequence is two conservatives. We had Wellington, Halton Hills, and then we had Norfolk Alderman. No, it's only on this. It's only two. I'm gonna. Let's go. We'll take a break for a second. I want to make sure everybody's heard correctly here. in the count. I apologize. I just want to make sure. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve to know what this government is signing away. It is irresponsible to negotiate pandemic response powers when we haven't had a public inquiry into our own pandemic policies. How how can we prepare for the future when we haven't learned the lessons from the past two years? While the, will the Prime Minister tell Canadians today when a public inquiry into government COVID responses will be established? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. This is the lesson we've all learned from the past two years. Vaccines save lives, yeah. Mr. Speaker. We know that basing our response to this pandemic on the best, best public health advice, which includes uh, getting as many Canadians vaccinated as possible to keep them safe, uh, is exactly the way through. And it is a shame to continue to see the Conservative Party supporting views uh, that vaccination is not uh, the way through this pandemic. As we deal with the continued consequences of this pandemic, we will continue to stand with science and ensure Canadians continue to get vaccinated. The Honourable Member of Calgary Skyview. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are outraged by Russia's despicable invasion of Ukraine. They are following the situation closely and we're pleased to see economic sanctions to those who have a role to play in this. 
They also want to ensure those directing, perpetrating and supporting this willful violence are held accountable for their actions. Can the Prime Minister tell us what measures Canada is taking to hold Russian collaborators accountable and prevent them from entering our country? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I want to thank the member for Scalgary Skyview for his question and his incredibly hard work in his community. Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine is being met with severe coordinated economic sanctions and increased pressure from Canada and our allies. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, Canada has sanctioned 915 individuals from Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. And we recently strengthened our regime by introducing legislation allowing officials to bar entry or remove to those sanctions, uh, those sanctions uh, their role for their role in Putin's war. We will ensure that the sanctions have further consequences in terms of immigration and and access to Canada. The, the Honourable Member for Nunavut. There are consequences when this Liberal government fails to implement the calls for justice by the National Inquiry on MMIWG. Indigenous women and land defenders continue to face systemic discrimination and violence from the RCMP. Indigenous women are increasingly overrepresented in Canada's prisons. Indigenous women are still experiencing disproportionate rates of violence. When will this Prime Minister stop offering empty words and start acting on helping to help Indigenous women? The, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, everyone has the right to live free from violence. Since we formed government, we've taken real action to end gender-based violence in our communities with specific emphasis uh, on the violence faced by Indigenous women and girls right across the country. We've developed the first federal strategy to prevent gender-based violence in 2017, and we're making historic investments to prevent and end gender-based violence. Our most recent budget invests nearly $540 million dollars to develop a national action plan alongside provinces and territories to prevent gender-based violence and support survivors. But we know there's an urgent need for even more action. We will not stop until gender-based violence comes to an end. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, the soaring cost of gas has eviscerated Canadian consumers. With an unprecedented 6.8 percent inflation rate, people are wondering, Where's next month's mortgage or rent coming from? All while the GST is slashing through what remains in their pocketbook. The government knows that it's raking in billions of extra dollars. Will the Prime Minister introduce a tax rebate like the fiscally prudent and compassionate Martin government did to help Canadians? Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. This pandemic and beyond, we've been there to support Canadians, and we will continue to uh, in making investments to support families and ensuring that the Canada Child Benefit is indexed to the cost of inflation, so it continues uh, to uh, to match the Canadian spending powers, uh, and in moving forward with historic investments in childcare that is saving families across this country thousands of dollars every month, uh, every year, uh, that will help them with the rising cost of living. We know Canadians are facing challenges. We will continue continue to be there to support them. Well, that's all the time we have for question period today. Uh, before we move on, I just wanted to apologize to the member for Haldeman North.